You know, far often talk of the so-called sequester ignores the very real people who feel the pain of unfair cuts. Our job as representatives is to be the voice of our constituents. Well, tonight I hope that we can have a frank discussion about what these cuts really mean to all of our communities. My colleagues talked about the 750 to 1 million job losses that could result as a loss as a result of the sequester. Any day, Congress can pass a reasonable, balanced deficit reduction solution to avert these devastating across the board cuts. That's what the American people are asking for, in fact. According to a USA Today Pew Research poll, three out of four Americans surveyed said that Congress should focus on a balanced approach to the deficit with the combination of spending cuts, strategic spending cuts, and additional revenue. Now I know here in Washington, sometimes the focus is more on scoring political points or seeing who can win the blame game. Well, Madam Speaker, the American people are watching and they are fed up with the broken ways of Washington. They came out and they voted in November and they sent a very clear message to all of us here in Congress that it is time for us to work together to put partisanship aside and to put our nation first. So if all parties would come to the table like we are supposed to, we can minimize the impact of the sequester on working families like mine in Congressional District 4. If we do our jobs like the American people are rightfully demanding, we can reduce our debt in a responsible way and get our economy moving again. So I call on my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Come to the table. Help find a solution. And let's fix some of these deep cuts that were never supposed to happen. I wasn't part of the Congress that enacted the sequester. I know my colleague, Mr. Jeffries, was not either. But we are here now. And we want to do our jobs on behalf of the constituents who sent us here. This is a victory for no one and a horrible loss for the American people. Now, if we let the sequester continue, our e economic recovery will be thrown in reverse. A study by George Mason University projects a loss of 2.14 million American jobs if we fail to act. Half of those jobs will come from small businesses, businesses that are the engines of our economy. Perhaps most unfair, as part of the sequester, our schools and our students will be hurt. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I voted along with many of my colleagues to not adjourn this body, to stay here throughout the so-called district work week to work with my colleagues across the aisle to try to come up with a balanced solution to avoid these devastating cuts. But the leadership, the Republican leadership, decided to adjourn. And so instead of spending time with our families, we went out and met with our constituents to listen to them about what these mean in their everyday lives. So let me talk to you about what this means in my home state of Nevada. Nearly 300 Nevada children will lose Head Start and early Head Start services. These are programs that provide critical early education programs. At a time when we talk about wanting to close the academic achievement gap, and allowing every child to start school ready to learn on day one, these impacts would deny services to 300 Nevada children. In fact, I already have 400 children who are on the waiting list for one of my Head Start providers, and families can't even get in to be served. 
primary and secondary education in Nevada would be cut by $9 million, putting around 120 teacher and teacher aid jobs at risk. Funding for Title I schools would be slashed. One particular elementary school that I visited, Matt Kelly Elementary School, over 50% of their allocation from the school district is Title I funding. How is that school supposed to maintain the services that they're providing to these young and deserving children? Services like nutrition programs, full day kindergarten, a parent center so that we can actually have parental involvement in our schools. That is what is under attack with these mindless across the board cuts. About 14,000 fewer students would be served and approximately 10 fewer schools in, the, in my district would even receive funding under Title I. Disadvantaged and vulnerable children could lose access to child care, which is also essential for working parents. When we talk about helping people get back to work, one of the biggest impediments for many families is having access to child care. Schools and families in my district need these programs to provide hungry students the meals that they need to focus in class, to fund math and reading intervention programs, and to keep their teachers employed. We can reduce unnecessary spending, Madam Speaker, but these are the wrong places to cut. And everyone knows it on both sides of the aisle in both chambers of this Congress. Now, some of these cuts won't heal. And as Mrs. Marion Wright Edelman of the Children's Defense Fund aptly has noted, we better be careful what we cut because some cuts don't heal. We don't get a second chance at Head Start. We don't get a second chance once our kids have moved on to the next grade with or without the schools that they need. We don't get a second chance at the whole formative experience of education that so heavily influences the path of our lives. Opportunities are just that. They're there for a moment and they disappear if you don't act. There is no reset button for your education. Once our children are in those classrooms, we set them on a track for success or failure. We tip the scales for or against them in the that they walk through the front doors of the schoolhouse. We ask our students to study hard, meet deadlines, and do their homework. That's their end of the bargain. We as parents are asked to be involved, to foster our children's growth, and to pay attention to their needs. As members of Congress, our end of the bargain is to make sure that our children's schools are well-funded institutions of learning. Well, if anyone is grading this Congress right now, we're not doing our job, Madam Speaker. We even gave ourselves a two-month extension, but we missed our deadline and let cuts go into effect that members from both parties have described as dumb, avoidable, and painful. Congress didn't make the grade. When it comes to fixing the deficit, you have to be careful what you cut. As I said, according to the Children's Defense Fund, eliminating early education investments now would increase a child's chances of going to prison later by up to 39%. Paying for that prison will cost nearly three times more a year than it would have cost to provide them with the quality early learning experience. Simply put, our kids are being shortchanged by adults here in Washington. This is an adult problem, and it's time for adults to be adults and to come into this body and work together and solve this for our children and their future. Let's make the right choice, adequately fund our schools, and look out for our children. I yield back.